uh, welcome. Well, actually, we're probably not live now. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this uh, uh, VTEX live session uh, of the Book Reading Club. This is, will be the third and final session of the book Java um, Pattern Essentials by Tony Babis. I actually have the book right here with me. Um, my name is Roberto Cortez, um, and I'm happy to have you, all of us, with me. So before starting the session, let's introduce uh, our uh, speakers here. So please, Ivan, uh, you can start. Uh, hello, my name is Ivan Ivanov. Uh, I work for SAP Labs Bulgaria, and together with Roberto, I'm running this uh, virtual jug book reading club and one of the leads of the Bulgarian Java user group, and I'm also uh, one of the uh, contributors to the JBoss Forge open source projects. And cheers with some fine Bulgarian wine. <laughs> cheers, man. Uh, Tony, will you be kind enough to introduce yourself as well, please? Uh, yes, hi, I'm Tony Bevis. I'm the book's author. I've been involved in software development for well over 30 years now. And I do some freelance work, and I also work for the Open University in the UK as an associate lecturer teaching software development. Thank you. And myself, as I already said, I'm Roberto Cortez, and I'm working for a company called Tommy Tribe, which is happy enough to also help sponsor this event by giving their free time for me to be here. I work mostly on Java E stuff, and I do a lot of uh, contributions for the JSRs um, and running a local jug here in my city in Portugal that's called Coimbra. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so presentations are mostly done. So for this uh, session today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the last piece of the book, which is going to cover Null object, simple factory, MVC uh, layers, and pretty much other useful patterns. But um, if you feel you have a, any other question that you, you as a viewer, want to put uh, that's not really uh, linked with those topics, we are happy to take it as well. So let me brief you a little bit how this is going to work. Um, if you go to our website, that's uh, virtualjug.com. You can join us there on IRC, and you can post your questions there, and I'll be happy to relay them to Tony so we can discuss them here on the live VJAG. Um, to kick things out, I think I think that uh, Ivan has a couple of questions that, uh, to ask Tony. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. As always, I will warm everybody up with some questions, but uh, I do really hope that uh, you have your questions prepared as well. Uh, on these very interesting topics that uh, and patterns that we all use in our daily work. Okay, so can we start now? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, the first the first chapter from the last uh, from the last sections of the books that we are covering uh, was about the null object pattern. Uh, and the book was written well before Java 8, uh, but uh, Java 8 uh, now introduced a new concept, uh, which was present in in a lot of uh, many, in many other uh, programming languages before Java, uh, and it's the optional type. Uh, so uh, they they say that optional is there is is there in Java to uh, to avoid null pointer exception. But uh, it, it has uh, it has some more some much more goals than simply avoiding that, uh, and that's also the, the case with null object. Uh, it's not there just to, to get rid of, of nulls. So if you are working, Tony, with uh, with Java eight, which of the two approaches would you prefer, and when would you get null pointer, and when would you would you, would you use optional? I, I do really like the optional type in Java 8. As you said, the book was written before that became a feature. And I think we discussed in the very first session that if I was to do a third edition, that would be one of the very things I would probably start to introduce. 
um, because I think the optional type is a very handy thing to have. It's probably worth um, thinking about the two situations in which null pointer exceptions can occur. There's one case, which is what the pattern and the optional type is for, is when a, an object can legitimately have no value or be empty. But the other case is where it's just a bug in your code. So it's worth just remembering that not all null, null pointers are genuine. Sometimes it's just a bug because it shouldn't be null. But taking the situation where you should you have situations where values can legitimately be null or have no value, I think the optional keyword is good. It helps you to chain together your methods so you can say an object, get another object, get another object, get another object in one long string. So it can certainly help to, to uh, save you having to specifically check a null uh, before you call those. And you can assign default values if things are null. So I think it's a very handy construct to have. Um, would I prefer it over the null pointer? Probably in most situations I probably would, yes. I think it's a nice, neat feature. In some ways, the, the null pointer pattern in the book is a bit of a workaround by, by creating a class, a sub -class in, in the case of the book, a subclass that specifically just handles null. There's kind of, it's sort of you're creating something to get around a problem rather than you're actually creating a genuine business object. So in that, it's kind of unsatisfying from that point of view. And I think the optional type just does solve that problem. So yes, I, I do prefer it as a rule. Would you wrap uh, any object that can be null in an optional all the time, or do you think there is any situation where um, the use of optional is not really needed? Yes, I think you need to think about each object in turn and think, can this ever legitimately be optional? Because I think in a lot of cases, it perhaps shouldn't be. If, for example, you're modeling, uh, modeling orders and items, if you have an item class that's been ordered, then it has to have an order that goes with it. It wouldn't make sense to not have an order that, that contains it. So there are only, there's only some situations in which it's legitimate to have no value. So I think you need to treat each, each uh, type you create on a case-by-case -case basis uh, in an ideal world, I think nothing would be optional. But when you know we have to live in the practicalities of of real life, and sometimes things should be optional. So I don't think you should do it as a matter of course. No, but use it where you can legitimately have no value apply. And not okay. as well. Let me give you an example. If that's something I've been doing a little bit myself. I'm not sure if that's like the right approach or not, but if you're, like, for instance, trying to find uh, a record on a table on a database by a, a primary key, and sometimes that record might not be there, which sometimes that happens because that's like the search that the user put on the application or something, do you think that that method that should return an object from the database that might not be there should return it as an optional? I don't know if I make myself clear, but yes, I said. Mm. Well, what do you feel about Potent it? Yes, potentially yes, because you can you can have legitimately tables which are empty when when you're starting off a new system from scratch. Those things can leg legitimately be be empty, so I think you could use it in that in that situation. Um, but you've still got to detect the fact that there's no record there. So you've still got to handle the fact that you've got to tell the end user, I couldn't find this record. So whether you make it optional or not, you might be able to get some neater coding by making it optional. Mm -hmm. I think you need to think about the individual case. Does it make yeah, well, sense? One, one, of the, one of the possible uh, ways to, to handle that is by returning null. The other way is to throw a, an exception. Yes. Either checked or unchecked. And yeah. 
the functional style and the functional pattern say that you should use optional mm -hmm. because it, it allows so many other operations, not only get uh, or uh, or else, but so many other things like filter, map, mm -hmm. flat map. Yes. It's it's the M word, the optional. It's it's a uh, it's a monad, <laughs> but let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. Now I think optional is a good a good choice in many cases, but I wouldn't use it every single time because there are going to be objects you create that shouldn't ever have no no values. Yeah, right. So think of it. So treat each case as a case by case basis. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of questions here, but uh, I'm still discussing like the best way to, to do it. Uh, can you please go on, Ivan? Uh, okay. If you say let's let's go on with my question. So my next question is is on the model view controller pattern. Uh, so that, that that's that's an area where everybody I guess has questions. But let let's start with my very general question. Uh, there, there are so many ways at the moment to develop a Java MVC web application. Uh, if you use Java E, there is JSF, which is a component-based MVC. Uh, slightly outside of the standards, there are things like Spring MVC and Struts. Uh, and if you step out a bit, a, a bit further and go to the JVM languages, then you can choose frameworks like Rails and Play. And uh, there is a burst of JavaScript frameworks nowadays that can, that you can connect via REST, uh, or actually they can connect via REST to any backend like AngularJS, EmperJS, BankBoneJS, and so many more. And uh, if you if you have to start a new pet project, which which approach of all these or uh, or many others would you choose? And also, if you if you have to start a big enterprise project with some uh, support that you have to, to provide, uh, again, which one of these would you choose? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I haven't used all of those technologies that you just said. I've used. Me neither. <laughs> no, I've used um, Java Enterprise with Java Server Faces plus, and, and also Prime Faces, which I quite liked as well. But I haven't actually done that for a couple of years, and the answer I give you to answer your question might not be quite what you want to hear from a Java perspective. I use Java typically for desktop applications. Okay. When it, when it comes to web developments, I tend to use um, content management systems that are PHP based, because what I find that gives me is an infrastructure that's already built. It takes care of user management, access control. Um, you can get some really nice templates that you can customize. Um, you can get pre-built components that you can just plug in to do all kinds of e-commerce things, all kinds of things that you can think of. And if there isn't something out there, you can create your own components, plug it in, and sell it. So for me in my situation, I find that is a better model. I find myself more productive doing that. Now, I'm not at all suggesting that you should all drop Java EE and do what I do. I'm just saying what works for me personally in my situation. So I haven't done any Java EE um, for at least two years, I'd say. When I did, it, I did used to use Prime Faces with it because I felt that yeah. was the most natural fit of all the other ones were a bit more like bolt-ons. Um, so that might not be the most satisfying answer for you, but that is the what I do. So. Yeah, it's, a, it's the, the same ex experience that I have. I mean, uh, a, a friend of mine asked me what should I use for for things that you mentioned, and uh, yeah, the, the PHP CMS uh, frameworks that, that are there on the market, like, for example, WordPress, are really useful for for the use cases that everybody uses, but if you but if you have to develop a an, an MVC a real MVC application mm -hmm. from from ground up mm -hmm. uh, from the beginning, what 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 would you choose? I mean, you mentioned prime faces, which is an ex 
an extension on top of the JSF. But yes. Yes, that is what I would use if I was using Java Enterprise. That is, I think, what I use. But that's primarily through, through familiarity. I'm less familiar with the other technology structs in Spring and, and all the JavaScript um, frameworks that are on top of it. Yes, a lot, of, a plethora of them have come up in the last couple of years, and they look very good from a cursory look that I've had at them, but I haven't digged deep enough into them to... There would be a learning curve for me if I started to want to use them, and I'd have to justify the time spent in doing it. So in my, in my current situation, I don't yet have the time to spend on that, so I'd probably go back to what I'm familiar with. But I would say on the content management system I use, the component development is MVC, so I'm still using MVC even in that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm guessing that uh, this discussion will we could be hours here discussing like frameworks and uh, what's best and what is not. And you have a lot of people with very different opinions on what is good and what is not. You have people who are going to defend Java stuff, people are going to defend JavaScript stuff, people are going to defend PHP stuff, and so on. And in the end of the day, in my opinion, you should just pick something that you feel comfortable, especially you and your team that you're working on. And as long as you guys are happy and you're able to fulfill the requirements on what you're developing and are able to comply with everything that you need to deliver, that's okay, right? Yes, absolutely agree with that. I think you, I don't think it's a case that one technology is better than the other. I think they're they're all good in their own way. You choose the one that's that's right for you in your situation. Most of us stick to what we're most familiar with just because of the comfort factor, the fact we haven't got to spend a long time learning other stuff. Of course, it's fun to learn new stuff, and we like to learn new stuff. But when it comes to the nitty-gritty of, of fulfilling our requirements for our job, we need to do what's most efficient and effective that we know and we're familiar with. So, yeah... I'm yeah, well, one, one, one of the things I usually I've seen the most on uh, when I work with teams is, and this is not like a criticism to anyone, uh, but sometimes I just see people that are coming to management or team lead roles and they come with a mindset of a framework or technology in mind, and that's not really what the team that they are going to manage are used to be working with. So they pretty much spend like a huge amount of time just to learn this new technology that the team lead is trying to uh, adopt or trying to have their te team to work. And they pretty much end up spending all this time and all this money uh, because, of course, time is money on software development. Well, on every, on every piece of, of the world, but especially on our world where uh, the time is very valuable and sometimes we just need to adapt uh, and adjust to the team that you have and I mean if you're joining a team that knows about .NET and doesn't know Java maybe it's you that needs to, to adapt and not them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I've seen that happen as well where a, management co a manager comes in and they try to enforce their own pet ideas because that, that was their background and they think that's the best or better than what the current team does, and it isn't necessarily the case. So, yeah, I think we can all we can all fall into this trap of thinking that what we know is better than what other people do, but I don't think that's the case. And I'm not going to choose between Java and PHP as which one's better. I think Java's better for desktop app. Well. PHP isn't designed for desktop applications, so there's no contest there. Java's excellent for desktop applications. PHP is excellent for web-based applications, despite it's it's had a flaky history, but nonetheless it's got quite good now. Um, so, yeah, I agree with what you said, Roberto. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for your for your insight and opinions as well. Um, so let's go into one audience question. So this is from, let me see, Ethan Skin, and maybe he found a bug in the code of the book. I'm not exactly sure, but um, he's mentioning that 
I don't know if you remember, it's probably a little bit of detail, but about the uh, manage engines panel uh, on the user interface here. So there's a piece of code that you have there. Okay. And he's mentioning that, let me see, he's getting an error because he's not able to resolve the list engines panel. Are you familiar with okay. that? Okay. I don't recall that error in particular. I would, I would have to look at the code and see if there's yeah. a bug in the printed. I'm sure it was working when I set it up. I don't. I don't recall. I'm afraid. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe he's using like a different version uh, of Java that changes some API. I'm not sure. Usually, but usually Java doesn't mess up with the APIs. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's saying that. When he's trying to do a J options pane show panel message dialog, you cannot resolve this tension panel. So maybe I was just asking, maybe you will have identified that error before and there was some kind of a rat out of the book. Uh, okay. I can send you the, the piece of code letter and the page so you can have a look. Uh, maybe he found something there. Um, but he, he will be grateful if you can help me at least fix it, to figure out the problem. So yeah, okay. let's let's move on. Uh, so we have another question from uh, E. Cabrerar, and he's mentioning something like this. I used to use the Observer Partner in a Java Swing application, but when I moved to a Java web application, I can't find some situations where the Observer Pattern can be used. Is your server pattern useless useless in a web application? Um, no. Um, you could, if you take the MVC, then the view can listen to the model through Observer. So it's one way you could do it. It's a, I'm not sure why the. Can you just review why the felt it was? Useless. I just want to get some clarity on why. So and now the volume's dropped out. Oh, sorry. Yeah, let me ask him here to see if he can give us more detail about his particular problem. Uh, in the meanwhile, Ivan, do you have some other topic that we can discuss? Sure. Oh, sorry, can I just say I just had a quick look at the errata for the book. And uh -huh. I've just seen there is some, going back to the previous question, which was oh, okay. the engines, there is some errata to do with um, chapter 29 and the J option pane show message dialogue. So, oh, yes, okay. so there is some errata already listed about that on the website. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So, for ESM scheme, if you're following us, please go to the books website and you will find an errata to fix your. Uh, code problem, and thank you so much for bringing this up. Yeah, Ivan, please go on. Okay, sure. Uh, so, well, well, we are still on the MVC pattern, or the control pattern. Uh, there, there are some more patterns in the MV space. Uh, so there is model view presenter uh, and model view view model, so MVP, MVVM. Uh, to name a few, uh, do you have experience with uh, with some of them? And if you have experience, uh, would you share some use cases where you'd prefer one of those over the other? Um, not much. I haven't used MVVM, although I've heard of it, of course. As for Model View Presenter, I've only used it a little bit. I think it's I didn't see a compelling case for me to switch over to it. However, I can see that it might be easier to do things like unit tests using MVP as opposed to MVC. But I didn't see enough of a enough of an advantage to overhaul everything just to just to switch that. And if I was developing something new again, I don't. I might use it, but I haven't really. Thought it's compellingly better than MVC. So, 
And I think Martin Fowler has written about even some new ones. I think one's called Presenter. Um, I can't remember now. It's been a while since I read about it. But um, so even since MVP and MVVM, there's some new thoughts, new thoughts still. So these things do evolve. <laughs> People have new ideas, but I tend to stick with MVC. Okay. Cool. So I'm still waiting here for the uh, clarification. Ivan, do you care to continue, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Again, on MVC, I have, have one more question. Uh, so in MVC, uh, in Java at least, uh, we have getting and setting of, of properties on the on the model. Uh, and it's done usually either by the controller or by the model itself. So um, at the moment, uh, some languages and frameworks uh, support things like properties and binding. Mm -hmm. So this allows not having to write boilerplate getters and setters, I mean the properties thing, mm -hmm. uh, allows us to, to avoid writing boilerplate things like getters and setters, as well as to, to bind models property to a view control and change its value not only from the model but when the, the value uh, in the view changes as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that the, the, the control the, the, the controller uh, is not taking care of this. Uh, so there were some very heated discussions I remember back in the time I, I guess when, when Java 7 was, uh, was in the making so, so it was maybe 10 years ago or something like this whether Java needs uh, those features or not. Uh, and mm -hmm. the, the properties and binding, I guess they made it not to Java, but just to, to Java FX uh, back, back then. So uh, now nobody talks about that, about uh, properties and binding anymore. Mm -hmm. So do you find these features important for, for Java? Or, yeah. <sighs> Not overly, because I would say any decent IDE you can generate a lot of boilerplate boiler code for you anyway, and do a lot of these things. So I don't think it's a particularly compelling case for it. I didn't get involved in the heated discussion you talked about about it. Um, I don't have a strong opinion. If if those features came along, they might well be useful, but I don't think it's a deal breaker not having them. Because, like I said, IDEs can generate your entities and all yeah, that, stuff that's that. about that's about the properties. But what about the binding? I mean, the, the yeah. For example, for example, Angular JS, uh, it, it can it, it supports two-way binding. So you say this property from the model, uh, it's bound to to that view. So whenever mm -hmm. whenever whenever something changes in the view, when the user enters something in the view, then it's automatically updated in the model, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a compelling feature. That's at, at the moment in the pure MVC style of programming, it's implementing, I guess, in the controller. Mm -hmm. So the controller is somehow the the connection between the the model and the view. Uh, yes, there could be a case for it. I haven't mm, missed yeah, it. In, in JavaFX, if I'm not mistaken, in, in JavaFX they support something like this, or they used to support something like this, like binding a property to, to something in the model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think it's a compelling feature for a language like, like Java or, or MVC framework in Java? I don't think it's that compelling. I think it might be useful, but I don't think I don't particularly miss it. I can get by without having that. I don't think it's a big deal to have and not have it personally. Okay. Yeah, like we just said as well that now you have also other tools like uh, Lombok that. Yeah. You can even generate. You don't even have to generate getters and setters anymore. Mm -hmm. They'll just be directly put into your bytecode right away, and you don't even have to have the source code polluting your uh, classes with all those getters. Yeah, I've worked on a couple of projects with with Roberto together, 
pet pet projects, and he's using Lombok everywhere. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm probably gonna post something about it. But on, honestly, I think that's more than enough time to probably have some kind of keyword in Java that allows you to like say, hey, this property should have a getter or a setter, and you don't have to write it because I mean you end up writing all the same code all the time, constructors, mm -hmm. getters, and setters, and this should also actually be something that should be available for you as a toolbox. You shouldn't have to worry about having all the time to write yes. this code. Yeah, it's sure, Groovy, pretty Groovy much has it. Scala yeah. has it. All, all, C all. C sharp has it. All, all modern languages have it now, and if Java wants to be yeah. as a modern language as they did with the uh, the new, the latest Java 8 with lambdas and streams and all of that, they should also improve that department, in my opinion. But I'm guessing that Lombok is like a a good uh, alternative for the moment. So. Uh, okay, so returning a little bit to the observer pattern, so Ekavrar, he just mentioning that, he's just talking about general situations, uh, he just feels that the observer pattern is not used frequently in web applications, uh, but that's just the general mm -hmm. feeling. So may maybe, maybe like the best idea is, uh, do you remember any use case or any example that we can give to this uh, uh, this user uh, about uh, the observer part in your web application, so it's probably you, easier. You can, the view, you can Hello? Uh, I think we are losing Tony. Ivan, are you still with me? Yes, I'm still here, and I'm afraid I have to dance now. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Uh, you, you, you. I don't even have to tell you that anymore. You already know. <laughs> you already know the drill. Uh, I haven't. I haven't had so much, so much trying to be able to dance. <laughs> well, let's just uh, have you drink some more so you can dance for us then. <laughs> okay. So Tony, are you with us? Or? Yes, hi. Sorry, I have to oh, great. For a okay, music. awesome. You, we were like. Ten seconds away for Ivan dancing so for us <laughs> to entertain our audience. Thank you, Tony, for coming back. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I was mentioning to you, Tony, that uh, maybe you can give us an example of how you could use Observer Partner in a web application to this uh, uh, user. I guess we lose, lost Tony again. Okay, I guess you have to really have to dance, Ivan. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> Give me a chance, Tony. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm back, I think. Okay, yeah. awesome. Uh, are you with us, Tony? I think so, yes, I can hear you. Okay, cool. So I was mentioning maybe you can give us an example of how to use a server pattern on a web application. So this user is also, so a Cabrera is also mentioning that in a Java string application, he mostly uses the observer pattern to send notifications between windows. So mm -hmm. one window can be set like the subject, and another like the observer. Yes. And something changed in the subject, send a message in the observer. So yes. maybe we can give an example on how this can work in a web application as well. Well, the view can be the observer of the model. It yeah, seems the obvious one to me. So instead, it, normally um, the view would have a direct reference to the model, but it could have an indirect reference through an observer, whereby the model triggers events, and the view just listens to those events. I'm not sure that's widely used, but that you could use it in that sense. Yeah, I think so. That that's maybe a good approach. Um, I'm guessing that if you look into, I'm not sure if any of you guys are experienced with uh, with Angular, but Angular does something similar as well. Uh, so 
um, you can pretty much use the example of AngularJS to do like the observing of uh, stuff going on on the HTML and then update fields on your JavaScript side and, mm-hmm. and so on. So that's something that you can probably use uh, as well as like a observer pattern in a web application. Mm. Um, Ivan, I think you have some more questions for Tony, right? Yes, I have. But what about our audience? Is are they? Yeah, actually? they are. They are here writing to me. So uh, let me clarify a couple of things here. So just go okay. on. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Let Let me ask my next question. So it's on the layers pattern. Uh, mm-hmm. This This layers pattern was was really uh, was really interesting a, f- a few years ago. Uh, when we were splitting our application into several several layers, and they were basic, these layers were basically done by by different teams. So we had a team that was doing the database layer, and then the team that was doing the presentation layer, and also the business layer. Um, but nowadays, people are not talking so much about splitting your application into tiers or layers, tiers of layers, but more about breaking a monolith application into microservices. So it's uh, something like orthogonal split. Uh, and every team has uh, is, uh, has people that are uh, specialists in, in all in all the the, the in, in all the technologies, the UI, the, the business layer and the, and the database. So uh, there is a lot of hype about microservices today. And what is your opinion on this uh, on this hype? I think they could become very useful, actually. Um, you've got to be careful not to replace one one set of complexities with another set of complexities, because if you have lots of microservices, you've got to get them all talking to each other and integrating and and tested. So there's an overhead in, in doing that. So uh, it's not uh, it's not a panacea, but I think there there could be some mileage. There could be some mileage in it. Sometimes these things come and go. If we look at SLA, for example, there was a lot of hype over that, but then it just didn't. It, it just wasn't able to sustain itself. So I don't know whether microservices will go the same way or not. I think there's a lot of potential in it by having small little components. Uh, potentially in different technologies, but which can talk to each other. I think, yeah, that, yeah. There's a great theory behind that, but making it all work together, um, you could have a lot of overhead in terms of network connections, in performance, in memory management. So I think there's a lot of hurdles to overcome before it becomes a mainstream thing. So it's probably early days and too early to really predict how it might go. Yeah, in, in my opinion, if I, if I can sh- also share my opinion about microservices, uh, I think that the, one of the extremes is uh, the monolith application. But the other extreme is something like uh, put every table in its own database and it, in, 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 in its own uh, microservice, which is, which is a bit too much. And uh, the, the microservices concept was... Uh, was somehow uh, discussed and written uh, in this domain-driven design book uh, a few years, quite a few years ago, by Eric Evans. But it was not called microservices in that book. It was called bounded context. Uh, so if you can really find your, in my opinion at least, if you can really find your bounded contexts uh, in your application, then you could really. Only then split your monolith into separate microservices. But splitting uh, a different, just one ta- one table per microservice, uh, as you as you said, Tony, communication on the internet, on the on, on the network, uh, is uh, has also been taken care of. So it's not the greatest idea to to, mm. to organize your microservices on your database tables. No, it only takes one connection to go wrong, like I've been dropping out a couple of times, and you've got <laughs> to have some way of 
uh, getting some alternative that can switch in. So I think it's there's there's a lot of hurdles to overcome. I think before that could become mainstream. Yeah. So let me also add a little bit of my experience on that on that department. I think that uh, most people look into microservices as a good thing because they didn't know how to actually write the proper applications uh, before. They were uh, very tight to this idea of like a free tiered architecture with all these layers and with all these VPOs going on. So just to give you an example, sometimes I go to some customers and I see those these big monoliths, these big applications where they're just following, sometimes they're not even following like a free tier architecture, it's following like a six or seven or eight tier uh, layered architecture. They don't even know uh, what the that, does that mean. But what sometimes it usually see is over all these layers, I pretty much call it like the delegate, the delegate layer. It's kind of like an onion, right? It's kind of like all these layers that they don't do anything, but they just like uh, do a delegate to call the next layer, and and that's it. So to give you like a further example, I a few years ago I worked in a customer where they have like just a simple web app application, and I remember that if I needed to add a field to a screen, since I went to the screen until the database, I had to change almost 36 files. <laughs> yeah. And most of the files were just like passing parameters and do a method call. Because people that just say, okay, let's just do, let's just put this tier over here or this layer over here to handle transformations or this tier over here to handle business and this handle over here to handle database. And and then you have uh, the objects that come from the database, they are transformed to DTOs, and then DTOs are transformed to web objects, and then web objects are transformed to JavaScript objects or whatever. And sometimes it just, you only need the, like, you just need to make like a services and return it directly. You don't need all these uh, infrastructure. So I, I think that uh, these microservices uh, thing, I'm not criticizing in any way, but becomes a little bit popularized because people didn't knew, or some people at least didn't knew how to proper write applications, and they wrote these big monoliths. And now, when these microservices came and told them that they can do things in another way, of course, they gained some popularity. On the other hand, I would also like to add that, and maybe, and I, I hope I'm not saying any mistake here. But I think these microservices were very popularized by Netflix uh, architects and the Netflix, uh, uh, Netflix things. And, and Amazon as well. Yeah. So w one, one of the things that was also mentioned is, uh, and because of what you already been describing about uh, all these network issues, all the, the complexity that goes, goes around uh, to build the microservices, you're going to spend a huge amount of money to build all your infrastructure as a microservices because the, the management or, and the effort that you need is going to be greater than if you just build like a simple app uh, that can do your thing. And for, for Netflix, it makes sense because they wanted to make like a very um, uh, aggressive approach to the market and they had the money to spend, so they do it. But you as a company, you also need to think what's best for you and what you should do uh, to write your own apps. Yes. I remember many years ago, there was talk about um, vendors producing small components that you could plug into. So your own application could plug into these external components. Um, which in a way, is uh, microservices is trying to achieve, so there is a potential. There is a potential marketplace if it takes off. But but then of course you're putting, uh, you've got all the research that goes into what components of all the different vendors suits my purpose. Does it suit all the purposes I need? Do I have to write it myself? 
I think it's, it sounds great. It sounds great in theory, but I think there's a lot of issues for it to work in practice. Yeah, well, I mean, it's almost as the, as the same discussion I was having with the technologies, the same thing applies to uh, methodologies and uh, ways to develop software. Microservices are going to be awesome for some companies, and they're going to be a uh, train wreck for another ones because they they're not able to do it. So you should always pick whatever is best for you in the end of the day. Yes. So uh, shifting a little bit from microservices and turning uh, to MBC, yeah, I'm guessing that we should probably do like uh, just for just a full session on the microservice or even like <laughs> three or more. You yeah. always have people discussing about this. Um, I'm guess I know that probably Tony, you're not uh, you're probably not very aware of this, but this is a question that we have. So, but the question is, uh, what do you think about the specification of MVC to Java E8? I'm not sure if you know. About no, the, uh, I don't know enough about it, so okay. I can't answer that question. Okay. Okay. Uh, and yeah, Ivan, can, do, do, can, do you know yeah, something? Give you, give you some details because uh, we did. Uh, in, in Bulgarian Java user group, we did uh, the, a couple of uh, hackathons on this. So basically, in Java EE, in Java EE there is already um, an MVC framework, which is JSF. Uh, but JSF is a different kind of MVC framework if you look at it from the perspective of Spring MVC or Struts. Uh, JSF is, is a component-based framework. so. Uh, yeah, I don't want to go into the details here. And uh, in Java E8, we are going to have uh, something that is action-based uh, MVC framework, which is the yeah JSR three seven one if I if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and there it, it's heavily based on to, it's working on top of JAXRS, uh, so you can write the code that, that you usually write in uh, Spring MVC. So you have you can annotate uh, some controllers with add controller. Uh, it, it wires up very well with uh, with your uh, with, with CDI and with EJPs. Uh, so you can you can pretty pre pretty much uh, wire in your controller your business logic, and it very well very well connects uh, with uh, all the view technologies that that uh, that you that you know. Uh, by default, it, it supports JSP as templating technology, templating engine, and facelets. Uh, but but you can provide view provider for any other technology. Uh, so yeah, in in Java E8, uh, we are going to have uh, action based action based MVC uh, like Spring MVC or Struts. Mm. Well, this is a question for both of you, since well, I'm not very familiar with MVC, uh, but I know that Liz Tony has an MVC experience on the swing side, and now um, Ivan on the specification side. Don't you guys feel that MVC already comes a little bit late uh, to the Java standards? So again, there is MVC. And it's JSF, it's com but it's component-based MVC. If you're asking about action-based MVC, maybe you are right. I mean, uh, to standardize something in Java, in Java Enterprise Edition, like a JSR, you need some time. But Struts, Struts was there for so much time, for so many years. So the knowledge is there. JaxRS is, is for so many years. And yeah, I think it took it took it took quite some time to 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 get there. That's my personal opinion, and hopefully Java e is Java e eight is is on time. <laughs> Tony, what do you think? I don't have much to add to what Ivan said. Actually, um, we've managed to get a, get around the lack of it in the in the framework just by coding it. So um, yeah, it'd be nice to have it. Is it late? Possibly, but I'd rather they spent the time and get it right. So I don't think it's been a big issue. It hasn't been an issue for me. You, just, you can ju you can just code it anyway. 
Of course. Um, Ivan, uh, do you have a couple more questions? Yes? Yes, I have a few more. So, uh, well, while we are still still on these layers pattern, going to assemble three tire application that, that you that you that you wrote and you presented in your book. So, um, in that application, the code that the code that you that that you gave there was structured in packages following the layers. So you have a package for the UI layer, a separate package for the business layer and the separate package for the database layer. So these packages were containing the, the classes that handle the, the business logic in these layers, or the logic actually in these layers. Uh, was this structuring because the application was really simple? And in the real world, uh, would you prefer uh, that layout, or maybe uh, the package separation would be uh, based on features? So um, an engine package? That will contain the business logic, the view, uh, and some other logic about the, the engine, the gears package, the audio system package, and, and so on. Okay. Yes. I mean, yes, it was kept to the three, the three layers because it was a simple example for the purposes of the book. <clears throat> but perhaps I can answer that in terms of um, desktop applications using Java. And I use the uh, NetBeans IDE and the NetBeans platform in particular. And the, I, look, I quite like the way that, that handles this. And what you do there is you create separate modules. Now, a module is a self-contained component, effectively. It's a jar file in its own right. And it consists of any number of packages that make up that component. Normally, you don't need that many packages in, in, a, in a particular module, it might only be one, two, or three. Um, but the fact is, you can package together those, you know, group together those separate packages into a module, which is a self contained unit, and then you can set dependencies so that other modules are dependent on that, but you can't, you can't have cyclic dependencies. So that's an important point to you know, remember, not a can depend on B, provided B doesn't depend on A. So you would have separate modules for your engine and separate modules for your um, orders and separate modules for your sales and whatever. But there will be dependencies between them. I would probably also have separate modules for the user interface rather than integrating user interface into the, into the model for the the actual data as well, because I think it's better to separate as much as you can the business context from the presentation layer. So you'd have separate modules for each of the business components, or, or the way that you demarc demarcate it, and separate modules again for the presentation layer, which has dependencies on the business model. So in a, in a decent sized desktop application, You'd have perhaps a dozen, two dozen modules with dependencies between them, and you've got a nice uh, component-based, effectively, structure from which each component in itself is fairly straightforward and easy to maintain, and and it, it just helps to modularize your application, and that's really a, just a logical extension of what the example is in the book. So the example in the book has one package per component, effectively, but in reality, you want multiple packages potentially per component, just so that you can you can have greater control over your access modifiers, for example. So one of the packages might have public access modifiers; the other ones might not be accessible to other. So even if another module has a dependency on module A. It only has access to the public package, which you tell it is accessible. Cool. Um, okay, guys. So we are mostly in the end of our session. We have five minutes left. Um, still have the audience discussing things here about the MBC. Uh, but I know that Ivan has like one last question for you, right? 
Yes, I have one last question. <laughs> okay, so uh, again, in, in your sample three, three tier application, you implemented the singleton pattern with an a, a num. Uh, and would you would you recommend that approach of implementing the singleton pattern uh, for most of the cases as enums are singleton guaranteed by the language and the platform, mm. the Java language and the Java platform? Yes, I do. I do for most cases. I think it is the neatest way. It has a couple of advantages, three really. Uh, one is it's very simple to code, but perhaps more importantly than that, you've got um, a guarantee of singularity Whereas with other other approaches, you might have this issue is that if you restore from a serialized version, you could potentially end up with duplicate symptoms, which you want to avoid. So the enum avoids that. Um, it takes care of serialization for you. You can guarantee um, it, the instantiation is guaranteed to be um, thread safe, but you still have to take care of other methods that you have make sure they're thread safe, but the instantiation itself is thread safe. So those are two big advantages to me. I think there's perhaps two use cases where you, you couldn't really use enums. Um, that is one if you need to um, inherit from another type, because as far as I know, enums can't inherit other than enums. But I don't think you very often in, inherit from other classes in singletons. And the other case would be if you need lazy initialization because enums are initialized automatically so if you if you particularly need it to be lazy loaded you couldn't really use an enum but again if it's just a single object you're initializing it's there's not a big overhead anyway so they're the only two downsides I can see where you might not want to use an enum as a singleton um, most rest of the time, I think it's a good approach. Um, I believe it was Josh Block that first um, came up with the recommendation for that for using um, sing uh, enums as singleton. So yeah, we, yeah. we had Josh. We, we had Josh Block uh, and his effective Java book uh, interviewed before before you. So we, we were discussing enums with him as well. That's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was our first uh, guest uh, yeah. on our uh, book reading club. That's good. I'll have to listen to that sometime. Yeah, <laughs> so that's actually a good thing that you brought this up of listening. So, so just so people know, we're pretty much done with our time and our in our session. Uh, so about that uh, listening stuff, I'm happy to announce that. Um, the book reading club sessions are going to be available as podcasts, so you're going to be able to listen to them uh, whenever you want to um, in any place. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure when these are going to be available, but uh, stay tuned and, and hopefully it's going to be available very, very soon. So all the sessions with uh, Josh, uh, our first uh, star, guest star, are going to be available as well as the this one that we did today and two previous with Tony are also going to be available as podcasts. So in the end I only have to thank Tony so much for taking the time to be here with us and answering our, our questions. I hope that you enjoyed your time here. Yes, it's been good. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, it was our pleasure and of course thanks also Ivan for uh, bringing all these questions and our audience for sure because if they weren't for the audience we won't be here to ask the questions to our guest stars. And uh, thank you to Roberto and to the virtual jet for organizing this for us. Yeah, thank you so much. So please stay tuned. We're going to announce uh, the next book for the book reading club uh, pretty soon. We already have, me and Yvonne already have a few ideas, but we're not going to announce them yet. But stay tuned, probably next year we're going to start a new session with a new book and new authors as well. So please follow our uh, Meetup website or go to our uh, virtualjug.com website to see the latest news and follow our Twitter account on virtualjug uh, to also hear the latest ones about us and the uh, book reading club session. Thank you again, and thank you so much for seeing and joining us on this session.
See you next time. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.